South Lakes High School was 81, 82 season. And I think he graduated like 79 or right. 80. But I, I, I heard he was, was a real deal. I'm serious. I heard he could really. In fact, real quick, real quick. I'm sorry. So when I finally got to know him, it was at Alpha Street Baptist Church. And he had his son. I had my son. My son, 6'8", played at Harvard. His son, about 6'4". So we you know we're reminiscing. So I said, so Gary, uh, um, I heard you you broke my, my scoring record at Groves. And he said, no, because I broke all your records. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> sounds like Gary. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> Gary does it. It doesn't sound like bragging when Gary does it. Because no, you, know no. you know he can back it up. There you go. There yeah. You so a lot of fun. So quickly, uh, Coach Lewis. So Preston and, and Keith, we call Keith Primo. We're all UVA guys. Uh, we all played basketball. I was 84 Robinson. Keith was 82 Annandale. Preston was 85 Fort Hunt. We gotcha. met playing, we met playing pickup and we just started posting these photos on Facebook, did this group, and then obviously, you know, it's really taken off. We've, we've gotten the whole community together. It's been a great team effort. Well, yeah. during Black History Month, they just uh, so many things that you had done in your career, which you know, I, I knew of you. We, my, I, when I played at Robinson, we scrimmaged you the year. You had Brian Allen's junior year. You right. guys destroyed us. You know, I followed your career, but I had no idea some of the things you had done. Just to kind of go, a brief sketch, I know you, you played it at, at Parker Gray, but then you integrated Groveton. Yeah. Um, you, you ended up as uh, first basketball class there. You went to WVU, was the first uh, class of uh, black athletes to play ba basketball at WVU. Right. You ended up going to Duke. Uh, you were the first black assistant coach there, maybe in the whole ACC for basketball as well. Second, second, second. in the ACC behind George Rabbling a year before in Maryland. Oh, George, okay, awesome. Yeah. And then I know you ended up at uh, South uh, South Lakes, you know, the yes. planning community. Uh, great opportunity there. You opened. You were the first coach at, at South Lakes, second. I believe. Doug Crawford you know, preceded me by a year. Okay, yeah, and you had a great success there. Ended up at George Mason uh, coaching the girls. A little change Women. of pace there, and then you uh, ended up ended up at the Mystics. The first coach of the Mystics um, yes. in, in yes. the WNBA. Right. And then you also had national team experience. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, uh, we're going to go through all of them in depth. I just want to quickly, uh, uh, Keith uh, Leonard here. Keith uh, played at Annandale. He was 82. Uh, right. um, he was a great basketball player, first team all district there. But he was an awesome soccer player. was the goalie at UVA. Um, at, um, when, I, when I got to UVA, he preceded uh, Tony Miola. Um, and then yeah. he played for the Washington Diplomats. Nice. So, you know, he's a great basketball player, great outside shooter, um, you know, just, just a scrapper. And then obviously a great goalie. Preston, um, uh, he played uh, pickup with me at UVA, really, really nice left-hander. Um, but, you know, I was in his history class at UVA. He was just a very bright guy. I remember I, he helped me study for some classes and stuff, really enjoyed meeting him. And now he's a professor at the University of, of Connecticut. Nice. Um, so he's done really well. And one thing all three of us have done a lot of is we, we, we just love reminiscing about old basketball. And, we, yeah. and it's, it's been fun, um, you know, getting the group together and, and, talk, and talking about these old games and players and, and where they where they've gone. So I think one thing we could do to start out, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, Parker Gray. I know it was it was the black school in the integrated uh, in the segregated city of Alexandria. I don't know if it was only for the city of Alexandria or if other kids in Fairfax County could go to it. Maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Parker Gray. Um, Absolutely. And I certainly want to start by congratulating all three of you for this uh, amazing um, um, look back on uh, Northern Virginia basketball. Uh, it, it's uh, obviously exploding from what I have seen. Uh, I don't know how long you've been involved. I, I've shared it with a lot of people. Uh, one of my former teammates, as a matter of fact, Charles Sias, uh, has just joined on just recently. Uh, we were at Park Gray together. So thank you again for doing this. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to think of myself as a, uh, not a novice, uh, and I don't want to brag and say I'm an expert, but I know a little bit about sports history, particularly basketball, uh, you know, in this region and, and the country. So, all right, I'll be brief. You guys have to cut me off, man, because I haven't coached a team in a while. So anytime <laughs> I get a captive audience, it's hard to get the mic out of my face, man. <laughs> the floor is yours. Yeah, all right. Okay, well, yes. Um, my family is a, I am a third generation Alexandrian and I am James Lewis III. My father, James Lewis Jr. was born on the Virginia Theological Seminary there on uh, Quaker Lane uh, where his father, James Lewis Sr. worked as a sexton handling the horses and keeping the buildings clean 
and uh, the furnaces uh, roaring in cold winters. So we grew up uh, six, at 1607 Quaker Lane, which is about three blocks from T.C. Williams High School now, and um, where, again, my mother was a quander and grew up in Springbanks. Uh, uh, her family, the quander family, predominantly were members of Alpha Street Baptist Church, but my dad was chairman of the deacon board at Oakland Baptist Church, right next to T.C. Williams, uh, for about 40 years. So we split between attending those two churches. And all of my four oldest sisters, I'm the baby, the only boy, uh, plus my mother, uh, graduated from Parker Gray High School. And yes, Parker Gray was, um, uh, actually, we just celebrated our 100th anniversary. And if you go to the Alexandria African American Hall of Fame website, you will see, among other things, a wonderful display of the bricks, uh, 40, 400 of which uh, have been um, laid there in front of Charles Houston Recreation Center, which was the original site of Parker Gray High School 100 years ago, 1920, it opened. My mother was the first May Queen there. So yeah, the history is amazing. Uh, Parker Gray was and still is dear to so many uh, of us from Alexandria. And it was the beacon of um, uh, Alexandria Black culture, uh, certainly educational aspirations were, were birthed out of uh, that great school. Uh, back in the day, I was born in 1946, which happens to be the same year that Earl Lloyd and his dream team members at Parker Gray High School uh, finished their uh, dominance. Mm -hmm. And, um, but my oldest sister, Naomi Lewis Brooks, who we just talked about earlier, uh, and her husband, Leo Brooks, were the last class or two to attend the old Parker Gray uh, on that site, again, where now uh, Charles Houston sits. And so and the, uh, the Grays uh, only went up to the 11th year then, uh, and subsequently um, it, uh, it moved, moved to having 12 grades and a, and a new location on Madison Street. So uh, my three sisters and I all graduated from the new Parker Gray, but yeah, it was a wonderful place to, uh, to just uh, be swept up in the arms of great administrators, great educators, and to, and to see the, the excellence in so many disciplines, uh, academics, uh, athletics, certainly, um, uh, the arts, uh, I mean, just Again, I recommend everyone going to the Alexandria African American Hall of Fame because in 2013, 15 of us, and I was very grateful and fortunate to be a part of that initial class, uh, were inducted. Uh, and you saw my brother-in-law, a general. Uh, we saw so many doctors and you know, ministers from throughout the area of Alexandria be inducted for the impact that they made on the life and the livelihood and vitality of, of Alexandria. And so um, I went to Parker Gray from uh, the eighth grade, which back then, again, I went to Lyles Crouch Elementary School on the south side of Alexandria. Uh, and before I go any further, you know, I, I said I, we grew up on Quaker Lane, uh, and I mentioned the Virginia Theological Seminary, which is still uh, one of the amazing educational institutions in this country. But for those of us who grew, uh, grew up in that part of Alexandria, uh, we were either call, uh, we're from Mudtown or Seminary. Seminary was a, was a, was a very uh, kind description. Most, <laughs> most people uh, you know, jokingly called us country boys or women from Mudtown because you know, we, uh, we had uh, uh, plumbing concerns, if you will. We had outdoor toilets. I'm trying to be very politically uh, <laughs> correct here. Uh, but nonetheless, that, that's what it was. And, uh, you know, my father told me stories about seeing the great Joe Lewis uh, run down Quaker Lane, which wasn't paved at that time, that time, right in front of our house when he was training for, you know, his uh, world heavyweight uh, championships. And so, so seminary certainly has a, a fun place in my uh, memory bank, and we had to catch the bus to go into 
town. You know, I mean, like like Alexandria was a big city or something. Come on, man. You know, so uh, <laughs> uh, but that's where that's where uh, our 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 lives uh, in, in evolved around. So I well, attended you Parker a- Gray from the eighth grade again because we didn't have junior high schools back then. Uh, and my best sport at that time was football, and I made the varsity football team at Parker Gray as a 12-year-old. Now, I didn't know the word prodigy, and I'm not saying that I was, but I'm just saying. (laughs) I was 12 years old, and uh, I thought I was going to be Jim Brown, and unfortunately, I tore my ACL in a a practice with with our team, and that if you ask anyone of my vintage, I'm 74 years of age. Uh, In fact, I was the MC for the Alexandria uh, Athletic Hall of Fame uh, 2019 banquet, uh, where we inducted um, the great, and I'll talk about them in a second, 1957 Parker Gray Boys basketball team, which was ranked number one in the area, and their coach, my coach, Coach Arnold Thurman. And so I made a reference to a guy named MacArthur Harris, who I have forgiven, uh, but he uh, he hit me with a uh, an illegal block in practice and tore my ACL. Oh, and that was the end of my football career. But uh, God had another plan for me. And uh, I learned uh, that I could play a little bit of basketball. So my ninth, 10th, and 11th grades um, at Parker Gray, I was the all-city player for the basketball team. And, and we were really good. But we did not win the state championship as uh, that 1957 team won because that was a third of three consecutive state championships, 55, 56, 57, but it was the first time that a Parker Gray team or an Alexandria team had been ranked number one in the Washington Post. Uh, And they had a 39 game winning streak. They were undefeated uh, for that 57 season. And uh, coincidentally, there were three teams tied for number one in that Washington poll final final poll. Uh, Montgomery Blair from Silver Spring, Maryland, and George Washington from Alexandria, which was right across the tracks. Yeah. Um, and there's a nice piece on the tracks on the Alexandria African American Hall of Fame, uh, talking about Skeeter Swift and Earl Lloyd. Hey, so, Coach, who'd, you, uh, who'd, you, who'd you guys play? Who would you play at the Parker Gray? Would you play like Dunbar, Spin Guard? You play Jenny Dean? You play? You probably played. Uh, you play Luther Jackson. You'd play Hoffman Boston. What are the kind of teams you play? At? And I would think you'd played against some great competition, right? Uh, Julian, yeah, I'm being modest, but it's not who we played, it's who we beat. We beat <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, yes. And, and, and that is, and I, I really hope that I can give a clear picture mm-hmm. from some 80, 70 years ago when Parker Gray uh, played in a league called the Virginia Interscholastic Association. Uh, with great teams from Richmond that we played, Maggie Walker, yeah. uh, great teams from Tidewater, uh, Huntington High out of Newport News. Uh, but predominantly, we played teams in Northern Virginia and in Washington, D.C. I would say, Julian, a third of our games uh, in basketball um, were not only pre, not preseason, but pre-conference games uh, against Washington teams. And so, yes, the competition was amazing. My sophomore year, we went over and played against Dave Bing and Spingarn when they were a juggernaut. Um, Dave uh, uh, and I have a good relationship. He's one of the speakers for the Earl Lloyd statue unveiling, which I'll get to in a moment as well. Uh, but uh, we got we got Dave back when we beat him uh, when he was at Syracuse when we were sophomores at Western University. But uh, Dunbar with Willie Jones and Jim McBride, who, in my opinion, was the best. They didn't have a player of the year in the Washington Post all met uh, picks then, but uh, you played against everyone, either with their schools or on pickup. And the team was loaded, no question. Uh, Bernie Williams from DeMatha went to uh, LaSalle, but I thought that Jim McBride was the best of all the players on that 1964 Washington Post all met team. He actually played at DeMatha for three years or two, and then transferred to Dunbar. And we were about the same size, 6'3", about 200. And he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was a horse. So we played Cardoza, Eastern, Dunbar, uh, Spingarn, 
Um, we played Fairmont Heights from, you know, right there across the, the border in Maryland. We played Pamunkey. Uh, that's a great name I always enjoy. We played uh, Frederick Douglass from Upper Marlboro, which is still there. Uh, and then, yes, we played Luther Jackson, which we thought was a, a country school, <laughs> you know, being from Alexandria out there in Maryfield. You know, it was before uh, the Beltway or Tyson's Court or anything like that. Uh, but I'm telling you, when we went to Douglas of Leesburg, we thought we were going to the moon. I mean, it took us all day on you know, a little yellow bus with our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, and all that. Uh, and we played Jenny Dean, uh, uh, Walker Grant down in Fredericksburg. The, the, the schedule was, was really uh, uh, not only challenging, but diverse uh, in terms of uh, uh, the three states in which we competed, uh, obviously with the state championship in Virginia being the, the ultimate goal. So, um, so, so was, was it a very tough, was it a very tough decision for you to go to Groveton? So how, how did the Groveton opportunity come, come? I mean, you must've felt very comfortable at, at Parker Gray. You're playing against great competition as well. And all of a sudden you have to kind of uproot what you're doing and you're going to go, you're going to go to Groveton and play against guys you probably don't know very well in a very tense environment. So how did that whole situation come to be? Okay. The summer before my June, excuse me, the summer before my senior year, um, my family moved from Quaker Lane in seminary to Shiver Drive, uh, which was a new development um, uh, called Randall Estates. Um, and a lot of, uh, actually my history teacher, Parker Gray, uh, <clears throat> uh, helped uh, to create that development primarily for teachers. Um, and so we moved there and Groveton was, you know, a pitching wedge away from our house. Um, I wasn't recruited or anything like that, uh, Red Jenkins. Uh, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I, uh, you let one get away. <laughs> that, uh, I went to Groveton because it was the school in my neighborhood. And yes, it was, um, um, you know, bittersweet, if you will, because I was at Parker Gray for four years and, you know, my coach was fabulous and the teams were good and the academics and everything I just spoke of, the culture was was amazing. And it's not like, you know, I, I planned or my parents planned, you know, that I was going to help integrate anything. It, you know, God ordered my steps and the timing was such that uh, that's where I went for my senior year. And it was a it was a good experience overall. No question about it. Uh, now, I know this is you know, about basketball in, in a large sense. So I'll, I'll say this, I, don't, I want to make this very clear. Um, again, my perspective is my perspective. Uh, and, you know, I, I coached for 50 years. And so I would tell my assistants when they went out to recruit, I said, you know, tr try to <laughs> try to look at who you were as a player through your lens. Don't, don't look at recruits through my lens or my opinion of who's good and who's not good. Um, because very often we can internalize that way and determine certain things. And so in my opinion, and I'll, 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 I'll put it in this perspective. Again, I referenced Skeeter Swift earlier. Skeeter was a year behind me, grew up in Alexandria, George Washington High School. He and Earl Lloyd, the only two male uh, basketball players from Alexandria to make it to uh, professional basketball. Earl was the first, as you know, in 1950, October 31st, with the Washington Capitals, broke the color barrier. And then Skeeter played in the ABA with the New Orleans team. And so when Skeeter and Earl were interviewed, Skeeter said, and it, was, it wasn't a surprise to me because we saw him there, you know, uh, you sought out the best competition. And whether you had to hitchhike or, or catch the bus or whatever, you went to DC in the, in the off season to try to play against Dave Bing on the playground or Willie Jones or, or whomever, because that's where the best competition was to help you improve your game. And Skeeter Swift said that he had to go where the black players were in order to improve to where he wanted to go. And so he was the second best player in Alexandria when we were coming through. <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. So uh, <laughs> now Skeeter can play. Skeeter can play. So I, I say that to say that your, your question about the competition throughout my perspective of high school from Parker Gray, which was amazing. We had a guy, ask your mother about Roger Wood from Luther Jackson, who was a year ahead of me and was built like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. 
<laughs> he was right-handed. And when he came to Parker Gray for his senior year, he didn't get the opening tip, but they got possession. And he went down the middle of the floor and they hit him and he dunked it left-handed and then we beat him by 40. So the point <laughs> is, the competition was excellent. The competition, in my opinion, at Groveton, albeit a small sample size, because in Virginia, you can only play four years, eight semesters. Well, I only played 10 games at Groveton, and I would have only been eligible, according to the Virginia high school rules, for those first half of the season at Parker Gray, should I have stayed there. Um, and we played good competition. I don't want to denigrate anything that I am saying in terms of what I experienced. We were nine and one in the 10 games I played. Uh, we lost to Jeff Stewart. Uh, and this is a team game, but I gave him 31 and 21 rebounds. And they had a first team all Met player. <clears throat> Excuse me, he was 6'5". And they beat us. That's Jim, okay? Jim O'Brien? Uh, no, no, man. He's, he wasn't even born then. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll think of his name in a second. Yeah. But uh, Vance Harkey, who this, was a senator from Indiana, um, son, Jan, was on that team, real estate guy in Reston, you all may know him. Okay, so so we lost that one game. But we also beat, you know, WNL, which was the best team, in my opinion, that we played, even though we lost to Jeb Stewart. And and uh, young John Hummer was a sophomore. And he was good, you know, 6'6". Six, six, and I had played against he and his older brother, Ed, over on Quincy Street in Arlington, where they lived. And so it, it was, it was um, you know, I, I was a 16-year-old, I'm not bragging, I was a 16-year-old senior mm. playing against mm. some 18-year-old seniors mm -hmm. uh, or 17-year-old seniors at Parker Gray. And um, I was always blessed with physical abilities to be able to jump and, you know, whatever. And I was raised on the courts where I knew you had to compete or you weren't going to play and older guys helped me with that development. So, so in, in, in evaluating the, the two experiences, high school wise, competition wise, Parker Gray was by far the more challenging because mm -hmm. again, the, the competition in which we were, uh, were dealing with and, uh, and Groveton uh, was a small sample size, but um you know, I averaged 22 rebounds. I'm six feet two. <laughs> and um, anyway, I think did, you get my drift. Did, did you not? Go ahead, go ahead, Preston. Well, Coach Lewis, uh, you know, it's interesting because we, we did see a picture of you in the um, Groton yearbook for the jump ball. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that injury you had at 12 affected your hops. <laughs> you really could get up. We could see that. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, and, and that that was not a uh, doctored picture. <laughs> now, you know, again, it, it, people didn't measure verticals, whatever. My first year at Duke was John, uh, David Thompson's first year mm -hmm. at North Carolina State. And, uh, and, and again, I saw myself through him. I mean, I wasn't David Thompson, but we had similar types of games, I thought. And he had a 44-inch vertical. And... Uh, and maybe I did, maybe I didn't. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, uh, and Julian, you asked, and again, just to give complete context, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in your questions that you uh, had assembled, you asked about, you, you mentioned the word tense environment potential at Groveton. When you first, um, when you first, when you first arrived. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I came in like, hey, I'm here. No, no, I was, I was the easygoing guy. I mean, I, you know, I just, I, I was who I was. And basketball was the great uh, equalizer, if you will. You know, like Earl Lloyd always taught me, you know, he, when he was drafted by the NBA, he had heard about these guys who were all Americans at Ohio State and all Americans Southern California. And then when they threw it up in the first practice, he was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from West Virginia State, but uh, no, I'm okay. I'll be all right. <laughs> and, he, and he started right away. So we had a good coach. Um, I mentioned, you know, <clears throat> my coach Arnold Thurman. Hopefully, I did at Parker Gray, who prepared us for to be all around players. I had a six six teammate at Parker Gray, Charles Lightfoot, who wasn't a great basketball player, but when I had to go against him, I think he really helped me to become a better rebounder because he could, he could jump. He just didn't he didn't have the, the love for for practicing or playing. So Groveton had a good coach named Vern Canfield, who 
who I jokingly to this day remind him that I, I got him his head job at Washington University because the year I graduated, he, he, he left Groveton to go to Washington as a head coach. But he's a good coach from Southern California, uh, and, and we had a good team. Um, so um, that jump ball pitcher, uh, Preston, okay, I don't know that guy's name, but, you know, I, I do remember stuff up here. <laughs> okay, it was either that particular jump ball or another jump ball situation where before he tossed the ball, he said, and I quote, okay, you ready, chocolate? <laughs> And I was like, did he say that in my mind? <laughs> so, and, and, and maybe that made me jump higher, Preston. I don't know. But, you know, that was the BS that came and boom. And like Obama said, it just, you know, you brush it off and, and go on and, and play the game. Uh, there, was an, there was a principal there whose name I know well, but I won't mention it. And he called me in his office. Uh, and it wasn't the coach who called me in the principal, assistant principal called me and said, Jimmy, I, verbatim, I mean, this is like yesterday. Jimmy, I know it's typical of men of your race, your uncles and your fathers, your father's fathers, <laughs> and your father to, uh, uh, to wear uh, facial hair. And I had a mustache. I mean, I had a mustache from the time I was 11 years old. I mean, what are you, what are you, you know? I, you know so, so he said, I, I, you know, I appreciate it if you would shave it off. You know, I don't, I don't know if the season had started, Perhaps it hadn't, and he hadn't seen me play yet. Otherwise, he may not have said that to, to, to no, just, <laughs> but, you know, I thought that was, again, one of those BS, it's, it, 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 it what, why? What, what, okay, so, uh, last little antidote. Uh, really enjoyed my teammates everywhere I've been. So, here I am, and, and uh, Kenneth Fells, I don't want to forget Kenneth. He was the other black member of the team at Groveton. He was a sophomore junior, had one eye, uh, made the team. And uh, he jokingly tells me that I came in from Park Grade and took his spot. I was like, okay, man. Yeah, right. Sure. Okay. You know, all, all, all five foot seven of you, right? Okay. <laughs> so, but um, we went to, excuse me, um, two of my teammates who happened to be white. And I went to Dixie Pig right on Bellhaven Boulevard and mm -hmm. Route 1. It's no longer there because I burned it down. No, I did not. I didn't. <laughs> we went there uh, after practice to get a, a barbecue sandwich. And, and uh, uh, two of my teammates, John Nelson, who you all may know uh, from Reston, uh, Yale graduate, played up there, baseball, and Grady Frank, who I just missed by a couple of years when I went to Duke in 71. He graduated from Duke uh, in 69 and was a lawyer in Alexandria. Uh, and a big time golfer at Bell Haven. So we reminisce about this because we went to Dixie Pig to get a barbecue sandwich, you know, just three teammates and, and, and Grady worked there sometimes on the weekend. So we're walking in and Grady sees the manager or the owner, or whatever, and he's coming towards him and us. And he says to Grady, you can't bring that guy in here. And I didn't hear anything other than, what I'm saying right now, he may have said something else, but he made it clear that I wasn't welcome. And Grady did this to, and Grady was a year behind me, so he's a junior in high school, and he did this. And I grabbed him by the back of his belt and pulled him back. I said, Grady, that's okay. No, we, we're out of here. And so when I reflect back on, again, the, 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 the means by which athletics has brought us together as a society, uh, uh, really being a precursor in, in, in a number of ways to social changes. Um, that's an interesting story about how uh, just three guys, teammates, you know, took care of each other, if you will, because Grady, Grady could still be in jail right now. <laughs> so, um, so, your, so your other teammates, than that, you know, it was no problem. No problem. Did you, did you know your teammates like from pickup ball before you, before you, uh, Went to Groveton, so you met most of them when you showed up the first day. Absolutely, yeah. Now, I, you know, even though my mother was a Quander, and, and as I said, you know, Quander Road is right down there near Groveton. Um, you know, my my forays, if you will, were more in Washington D.C. in terms of looking for games. No, I never knew any of the Groveton players at all. So when so when you decided to go to West Virginia, so obviously you could have gone to Hampton Howard, or you could have gone to you know historical black colleges. 
and historically black colleges. But you, the West West Virginia is on your is on your um, on your on your wish list or is one of your one of your choices. Um, what made you decide to go there? Because again, you're going into an area um, it's probably not as quite as hospitable as you know, a big city you, where you could have probably felt more comfortable, known known more people. But you went to Morgantown, and they had never had a black player on varsity. I guess they had a couple of football players before you. But why why did you decide to do it? Can you see? Play a little show and tell here. Okay. Yeah. Now this is from the Alexander Gazette and the and the Daily Anthem, the school newspaper at Western University. You had some hair uh, there. You had some, you had a lot of hair back then. Yeah. Oh, look look who's talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, you had to try to get a job with Jay Billis and. Uh, and the, the, the bold, yeah. whatever thing they have going on. Okay, real quick, all right. Uh, Earl Lloyd, again, was uh, the man mm -hmm. with his background from Parker Gray to West Virginia State College and Institute, where he was a two-time All-American and was drafted in the ninth round, the 100th player by the Washington Capitals, October 31st, 1950. Well, 11 miles from Institute is the capital of West Virginia, Charleston, and back then, the person who led small college in scoring at Morris Harvey College, now the College of Charleston, was a guard named George King. All right, stay with me. So Earl gets drafted, and then he gets drafted by the military, and his NBA team folded. He comes back and joins the Syracuse Nationals. George King is a member of the Syracuse Nationals. And in 1955, as teammates, they won the NBA championship. And they laughed about how they were 11 miles apart in 1946, 47, 48, 49, and never knew each other because of segregation, all right? So George King retired, as did Earl from the NBA, and George became an assistant coach at West Virginia University uh, under Fred Schaus. And in 1960, when Fred Schaus, who was always deemed a very intelligent person. When Jerry West graduated, he left to go to go to Los Angeles <laughs> Lakers as the first head coach. And so George King, his assistant, became the head coach of Western University. He recruited Rod Thorne, George King did, from Princeton, West Virginia. So they, they had had a run of three straight All-Americans, Hot Rod Hundley, Jerry West, and Rod Thorne, all natives of the state of West Virginia, and all similar, and you know, West was the best, but nonetheless, 6'3, six, 6'4, six, you know, you know, multi-positional players. And there was no scouting service of a sophisticated nature back then. So, you know, you, you stay in touch with your friends. And so Earl Lloyd and George King were talking, and George said, Hey man, he's players up here, you know. Um, and George said, Well, I, I know a guy at my high school, Jimmy Lewis, Parker Gray. So that's how hmm. I got on their radar. Um, I tell everyone, you know, George, George wasn't Santa Claus. Uh, you know, he wasn't giving out scholarships. You had to be able to bring it. And, 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 and the rest of the story is uh, Ron Fritz Williams from Weirton, West Virginia, up near Pittsburgh, was the three-time West Virginia State basketball player, All-American in football, basketball, and 100-yard, 200-yard uh, champion in track. Well, wow. 6'3", 195 pounds. You get my drifts. Similar types of players that Coach King always liked. And he averaged 33 points in high school. So, But his mother and father did not want him to be the first and maybe perhaps the only black player at West Virginia University on the basketball team. So he was ready to go to Michigan and play in the backcourt with the great Cassie Russell. Wow. The Big Ten schools were integrated, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I didn't know a Fritz. They didn't recruit me saying, hey, we, you know, we need you to get this, you know, or vice versa. Um, I made my decision based on the recommendation of Earl Lloyd that, sa that said to my parents and myself, this is a good man. He'll take care of you. He was my teammate. I trust him. Uh, and then they recruited me heavily and I visited and boom, you know, I loved it. And West Virginia at that time was the second most successful program behind Kentucky. Really? Right? Uh, yeah. Because UCLA hadn't made their you know, 10 championship run then. Um, and so I went there, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was three and a half hours from DC. We were in the Southern Conference. We were the northernmost team, you know, with Davidson and Richmond, you know, those teams at Citadel. And that's another whole story uh, from a 
from a uh, uh, challenging racial environment. Uh, but again, it, it was what it was, 1964, man. But um, I went up there and we had freshmen uh, who were all Americans and state players of the year and all that. Freshmen had to play varsity. And we had one of the top five freshman teams in the country. Uh, had a thing here of Wes Unsell, who was later my boss with the uh, Washington Mystics and his his freshman team in Louisville, where he averaged 38 points and 28 rebounds. Oh. Yes, that's not a that's not a mistake. 38 and 28 on the <laughs> on the freshman team as a six six center. Um, but we were one of the top five freshman teams in the country, and Fritz averaged 31 a game. Uh, I was the leading rebounder at almost 10 a game and 13 points, and I played 11 games and blew out my left knee. Mm. I go from being a 12-year-old prodigy. I didn't say prodigy. 12-year-old wannabe football player and blew out my right knee. And then here I am, a 17-year-old freshman in college, and I blew out my left knee after the 11th game. Uh, And so I, I I I had some good games at Groveton, 10, right? I had 11 good games at West Virginia as a freshman. So that 21 game period, you know, I, I, Jimmy Warren was our graduate assistant coach. You all know him from West Springfield High School mm-hmm. uh, at Falls Church, great coach. And he had played with Jerry West at WVU. He was our grad assistant. And every time I see him, he said, Jimmy, I remember when you could touch the top of the square. And, you know, that's what he said. And that's what David Thompson said. So it must be true. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I, I couldn't stay healthy up there. I broke my foot twice. Uh, mm-hmm. I was redshirted. So uh, I told Bob Huggins the other day, I said, hey, man, I still got another year of eligibility. You know, so he didn't <laughs> call yet. But, um, but I was a journalism major, really enjoyed uh, that aspect of my time in Morgantown, which was a college town, 10,000 students. Um, Pittsburgh was 90 minutes away, you know, where we very often went for social activities. Um, and, and the basketball was, was excellent. George King left to go to Purdue uh, and Bucky Waters, who had been a big time assistant on three straight final four teams at Duke, replaced him. So Bucky Waters was our coach. Therein Mm -hmm. lies how I ended up at Duke as his assistant when he went back, so. When you got healthy, did you get, did you start like your senior year? Did you get a chance to have a good season when you got healthier or were you always hurt um, in college? Yeah, Uh, to answer the question is, uh, Earl Lloyd, who thought I had potential to be a pro, saw us play and he said, and he wasn't being critical, he was just being real. He said, man, you don't even jump anymore. You know, you know, you go So I, I, I was like, hey man, I can't jump. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. um, no, I played 30, a total of 37 games in yeah. two years, my junior, senior years. We went to the NCAA tournament, won the Southern Conference Championship our junior year. Mm-hmm. And then um, our senior year, we went to the NIT uh, in, the, in New York City. So uh, no, I just, you know, and, and the crazy thing, if you will, is, is it is what it is. So I, I graduate in 68 with a degree in journalism and Earl helps me again, get a job with Chrysler where he was an executive in Detroit. And I play semi pro ball there. And if you know your history about Detroit basketball, St. Cecilia is legendary. It's like the Rucker, you know, even though it was a little church gym, but I played there, you know, Dave Bing and Jimmy Walker and all the guys were, were there, college, uh, Spencer Haywood, you know, I went to school, graduate school, University of Detroit, and I never had a second of, of problems. You know, it's the first time I ever dunked in a game was at St. Cecilia, you know, <laughs> and I'm 22 years old. Like, you know, come on, Lord. You know, I know you have a good sense of humor, but why me? You know, so, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah. And then you go, then you went from Chrysler and you went to Durham and you went, you joined the Duke coaching staff. No, no, no. Uh, uh, 18 months in Detroit, loved it. But I miss basketball. Never grew up wanting to be a coach. But my coaches were always such great role models. Bucky Waters, Earl Lloyd, uh, Vern Cantle at Groveton, and, and Coach Arnold Thurman at Park Gray. So I got a graduate assistantship at Tennessee State University, 1969-1970 season. <clears throat> I was a freshman coach. The center of my freshman team was Ed Tutal Jones. Mm. All right. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even know who he is. I can, Yes, we do. You know, yeah, no, 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 no. Anyway, yeah, Dallas Cowboys defensive end as well. Of course. 6'8", yeah. 230 as a freshman. 
and he was there on a two-way scholarship. He made the right choice. He's a good rebounder, but football was his his forte. Mm -hmm. And I was the assistant with the varsity. We went to the national championship game. We had two NBA players, Lloyd Neal, who uh, played when Bill Walton was hurt. And that mm -hmm. was all the time because Bill Walton was hurt with Portland. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ted Houndog McLean with Atlanta Hawks. Uh, so uh, Chuck Robinson came in the next year. So, I mean, Tennessee State, as we all know, uh, the historically black colleges, that was my, you know, after being in all black schools all the way through to my senior year, uh, you know, I was, I was back home, if you will. I love Tennessee State. And I loved coaching because we, we almost won a national championship. Uh, so I stay there, got my master's degree, and then went to Gannon College in Erie, Pennsylvania, same role, mm -hmm. freshman coach, assistant varsity. And then at the Dapper Day in the postseason All-American game uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, Bucky was there recruiting, Bucky Waters. He had just gone back to Duke from West Virginia. And I'm at Gannon College in Erie, Pennsylvania. And he says, uh, Jim, we need to talk. And so I'm thinking, OK, Gannon College, five blocks from Lake Erie. I never saw the ground for six months of the nine months I was there or ACC at Duke. So I, I, I took his offer and went to Duke in 1971. Yeah. Well, and that was, that was before Duke's, you know, great run of success in basketball. I guess it was kind of between like, Duke was good back in the fifties, I believe, but 60s. Duke was, yeah, sixties. I guess 60s, when, yeah. when you were there, Three straight final fours, go ahead. That's right. But they were kind of in transition when you got there. Well, Duke, yeah. if you call my working for three different head coaches in the five years transition mm -hmm. and transition it was <laughs> uh yeah it was it was it was not good we had some winning years we went to the nit whatever but nothing obviously uh the last coach i worked for there bill foster uh, yeah. did take duke to the finals and uh with jaminski and, then, uh, and Sp spinarco and those guys right was yeah, that gene yeah banks? i helped recruit yeah, spinarco and jaminski and uh gene banks came the year after mm -hmm. i left uh, and they lost to uh, Kentucky with the, uh, the brother that had 46 on him. But none Jack Givens. Givens. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Jack Givens. Yeah. So uh, Foster left, and then Coach K came in. The rest is history. Now, little, little known history fact here during Black History Month. Uh, as I told Julia before you guys go down, get on the phone, I guess, this Friday, uh, T.C. Williams will have its Black History Month program. And from 3.30 to 4.30, it'll be on public Zoom. So... You know, get your popcorn and your sodas ready. <clears throat> My nephew, four-star retired general Vincent Keith Brooks, uh, and I will do a one-hour um, Black History program, T.C. Williams, uh, from 3.30 to 4.30. And Vincent played for Coach K at West Point. Oh, yeah, wow. it's a small world that's connected. That's so cool. Yeah, this, this is yeah. He, uh, you know, he could play 6'4", left-handed. And yeah. like my son, who's 6'8", and left-handed, uh, who played at Harvard, uh, they both each played two years uh, at, at West Point for Vincent and two years at Harvard for my son. And, uh, you know, so so at least the, the, the younger generation in our family, they got smarter and they were like, oh, come on, this, this, you know, this sports thing, you know, where does it get you to be a coach for 50 years or yeah. to, to run an army? <laughs> coach, coach, your former assistant, Will Robinson, he yes. warned me. He warned me. He coached, he coached at Robinson after I left. Yes. He warned me that you know everybody. He says, well, he says, Coach Lewis is everybody. But Preston, one thing he, uh, before you got on the, on the call that was established, uh, Coach Lewis's wife uh, is married to General Brooks. And no, General my Brooks, sister. You, General, what's that? My sister. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hey, just because we're from seminary doesn't mean we, we roll like that, okay? Coach <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Lewis's sister is married Thank to you. G General Leo Brooks. General Brooks um, uh, went to Virginia State with my father. Uh, he was a fraternity brother with my father. And my dad was in Vietnam. He was his um, commanding officer. And then at, at my father's funeral, uh, General Brooks, uh, he, ga he gave the, uh, uh, the eulogy at my father's funeral. And I didn't even know this until we jumped on this call today. Um, Coach Lewis put all this together. So, you know, I mean, you're, you're, uh, Coach Robinson was right. You know everybody, you can, you can make this, your network is very large. Well, Julian, I'm going to put you to the test because you deserve it. Our daughter went to UVA, so, you know, don't think I'm picking on the Wahoos because we spend a lot of money. No, she loved it at UVA, <laughs> class of 68, Jennifer, <coughs> Dr. Jennifer Lewis, we're proud of. But uh, my three of my four older sisters all went to Ettrick. And I mean, let me see if you can, you can roll with me, Julian. High above the Appomattox on its lofty hill stands a school we love so dearly. And, and we, we always will. Virginia yeah, State. We always. Huh? Huh? 
I know. Yeah, yeah, for a guy yeah. who never went there, huh? No, but like, you know, my my father. Uh, I grew up going to the homecomings and yeah, and stuff. That's it's it's uh, not only did my father my father go there, but his his sister and his two brothers went there as well. So yeah, I mean, if you're if you're a country boy from Bedford, Virginia, there wasn't a whole lot of options in terms of colleges. So Virginia State was a a cost effective option. There so yeah, that. But, but anyway, Coach, so how did you, uh, getting back to Duke, how did you end up going from Durham to, to Reston and coaching uh, South Lakes? Well, Durham was a wonderful experience for five years, even though, again, the basketball, you know, wasn't uh, all that we had hoped for. But I met my wife there because I did go across town once or twice to North Carolina <laughs> Central University, where she was a student. Uh, and so I was a young man, so I don't want anybody thinking, you know, that, you know, anyway, Um uh, Karen was from Washington, D.C., is from Washington, D.C. We've been married 47 years this July the 20th. Uh, and she's been my best recruit, if you will, for mm -hmm. all of my life. Uh, I love her dearly. We have two children, as I've referenced, Jennifer and Christopher, who both live in Northern Virginia. So um, um, after the last coaching change at Duke, uh, I went to Tulane University as an assistant with Roy Danforth, who had taken Syracuse to the Final Four the year before. And uh, we were there for five years. And then they asked us to please uh, exit stage left. And so the, the whole coaching staff, uh, after five years, trying to you know beat Dale Brown up there at LSU, who gave a little bit more than room and board tuition books. That's all I heard. I'm not, you know, I have no, <laughs> anyway. So, uh, <laughs> um, so here I am with two small children, uh, Jennifer was three and Chris wasn't uh, even a year and a half, I guess. And uh, we wanted to come home because number one, I was tired of being on the road because here I was an assistant at two nationally recruiting based uh, organizations, certainly Duke and to a little lesser extent, but uh, Tulane was as well because we were in the Metro Conference and they were all over from Georgia Tech to Florida State to Memphis to Virginia Tech. It was a it was a, a geographical footprint that that was challenging. So I was tired of being on the phone and hearing my children and my wife say, "When are you coming home? When are you coming home?" Because recruiting then was uh, not as restrictive, you know, with dead periods as they have now. So, bottom line is, I came up to uh, look for a job and ended up uh, having a meal with George Felton, who was the coach at Park, Sioux, at Luther Jackson when I was at Parker Gray. Out there and in the so country. So we knew of each other. And uh, oh, I saw a hand go up there. Oh, no, I just, uh, it was out there in the country. Uh, out there in yeah, Luther Jackson. Out there in the country, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's a DC guy, so he was cool. So <laughs> here we go. So George Felton had coached uh, with Red Jenkins when integration came, you know, and Walter Hawkins and Skip Brandon and, um, uh, and George Felton and one other brother went to Woodson. Uh, and then George got into administration, was a princ principal at Madison, and now at this uh, fledgling new high school in a planned community called Reston, called South Lakes. And I didn't mm. know, this is how God led me again, just, you know, my steps were ordered. I've been very fortunate, very, very lucky, and, and hopefully preparation has, you know, been in there somewhere. Um, but George said, hey, I need a basketball coach. And I said, well, Okay. You know, you paying a hundred grand like like I made a Duke. Yeah, I made twelve five. <laughs> Hubie Brown, y'all. Okay, Hugh, Hey, I ain't dropping names. I'm just saying, this is this is the great Hubie Brown. Yeah. Oh wow. Right there. Yeah. 1971. Bucky Waters, Neil McGahee, Hubie Brown, and some good looking brother. <laughs> um, and so and so here I am learning at the feet of a master. I mean, really, just an amazing coach uh but hubie brown with three children was making seventeen thousand at duke so i mean i mean it's it's all in perspective so and i didn't get in get in it for the money uh, but i'm rich now i tell you that uh so <laughs> oh boy this is so much fun um, so, so i go to south lakes and i teach at langston hughes uh, intermediate school right next to south lakes uh for my first year and then i a position open at South Lakes High School and I taught there and uh, I wanted to teach physics but they wouldn't let me I, didn't, I don't know why uh, you know I had a degree from West Virginia in journalism and a master's in education 
I want to teach physics. So uh, he knew I was crazy right away. The, uh, and I coached the boys varsity. I did not know, this is how good of, or bad of a recruiter I was. I didn't know Michael Jackson was going to be a senior that year. But boy, when we started and I saw Michael Jackson, and then I saw everyone in the world coming in, Lefty and Coach Thompson, Michael was a great high school player. Uh, ended up being the player of the year in the Washington Post. In fact, this is so cool. You know, again, opportunities present themselves. So I, I coached, I was an all met player. I coached Michael Jackson, who was a player of the year, uh, Washington Post all met. And then some 25 years later, I coached Tierra Ruffin Pratt at, at TC Williams, who was the player of the year and still is in the WNBA. And in between, you know, recruiting Craig Harris from TC Williams, undefeated 78 team, you know, to Tulane University, first team all met. It's been really, uh, as we all know, a, a rich uh, plethora of players, men and women, who have come out of this region. You know, again, I started in 1946 in terms of referencing Earl Lloyd's matriculation or graduation from, uh, from Parker Gray. So, uh, so, yeah, three years at South Lakes, we had really good teams. Uh, we were 23 and two, Michael's year. And, um, and then we had Brian Allen, who was the regional player of the year, and Vince Howard, who went to Monmouth, and Robert Allen, who went to Tennessee State. Mm -hmm. On a phone call like Earl had made for me, mm -hmm. I called Ed Martin, mm -hmm. the man that got me into coaching at Tennessee State as a coach. I got a lefty up here named Robert Allen. He said, send him down. <laughs> Never saw him play. So that's, you know, it was a beautiful world back then when things were a little more innocent, but nonetheless effective. Yeah. Uh, and uh, three years at South Lakes uh, got me off the road. Um, and, um, and then the athletic director, Jack Cavance, who had played for Bob Cousy at Boston College the same yeah. years as, as, as I was in college, uh, offered me the opportunity to start the Division I women's program at George Mason. It, it was a wonderful, wonderful decision. I got smart and moved to the other side of the locker room. Yeah. And so, um, you know, when you, when you come to George Mason, first of all, you don't have to teach a class anymore. So it, you're back to 100% basketball, which I'm, which I'm sure is probably pleasing to most, it would be to me. But now you're coaching girls for the first time. Did you, did you find coaching girls um, much different than coaching men? Uh, only if they couldn't play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no I don't, 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 don't tweet on me because I'm not on Twitter. So, <laughs> no. Um, it, it took me a couple of years to uh, fully realize <coughs> the beauty of the women's game. And I'd watched it, you know, Cheryl Miller and my sister Naomi taught me how to play. I mean, so it wasn't like, a, you know, I was some dinosaur who, you know, always said, oh, women, you know, they can't dunk, they didn't play, you know. No, please. It's, we, we had some good players at George Mason, Carrie Chaconis, uh, Keith, I know you know all about him from her. From high. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, she had 51, man, I'm telling you. And uh, 14 for 14 from the free throw line and seven threes. We ran the C double play. And my good friend, God rest her soul, uh, Ann Donovan, who was our Olympic coach, was the coach uh, that night at East Carolina, our conference opponent. So now we really, we hit the jackpot with George Mason. We got a lot of good local players, a lot of international players, some international players. And, and then we had a pipeline in Pennsylvania and New York because Debbie Tannehill, who played for me, uh, his father, Art, up in Altoona, they were back-to-back -back girls national high school champions. And so he had a vested interest. And then subsequently, when I left to go to the Mystics after 13 years at George Mason, um, you know, Debbie uh, succeeded me and, and was there for like 11 years. So now it was a wonderful experience. I saw George Mason grow in so many ways from a campus of 90% uh, uh, commuters, you know, like 10,000 students, and now it's largest in the state of Virginia. And facilities like you wouldn't believe we played in the old you know field house uh lynn gym now it's called and and we christian we were the first team game to play you know uh, in the patriot center it was prior to lefty drizel and uh maryland coming over and giving joe harrington who shouldn't have got the men's job uh who that's another story who, 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 who should have gotten it well i just said that's another story so 
Uh, now we competed for the men's yeah. job three oh. years before. <clears throat> excuse me. The opportunity presented itself. Actually, it was when I was at Tulane, so it was probably four years. And uh, yeah. so. Yeah. And then. Yeah, man. Well, they, they coached somehow. So then you went to the Mystics. I guess yes. Wes Unseld. Wes Unseld was the one that they got you to, to come to the Mystics. He did. Yes. And, he hired me and he fired me. And, you know, if they fired Hubie Brown and the pros three times, they could fire Jim Lewis. I mean, ain't, you know, ain't nobody special. But, uh, but I didn't have the contract that Hubie had with the Knicks. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, but now, you know what it was, Julian, and in a large sense, you know, um, for four years prior to my taking the Mystics job in 1998, when they first began that franchise, uh, I had the opportunity to work with USA Basketball. And we won three gold medals and one silver. Uh, we were in Taipei, Taiwan, and won the Jones Cup gold medal. We were in Fukuoka, Japan, and won the World University Games gold medal. We were in uh, Natal, Brazil, and won the uh, first ever Women's Junior World Championships gold medal. And so having been around those elite world-class athletes, Tamika Catchings, you know, on and on and on, uh, and having wanted to be a pro player myself, uh, I then had some options. Wake Forest offered me the job. I turned it down. I probably, probably, because I know what the deal was. I was on the Olympic selection committee for the 2000 Olympic game, the executive committee. And, and I had been in the pipeline, if you will. Uh, so I'm not regretting it, uh, but I had three options. And one was to say, you had to be a head coach, not an assistant to be in the USA basketball uh, family of teams. And so uh, I probably would have been the assistant on the Olympic team, but I chose to take the Mystics job because it was professional basketball, second year of the league, you know, backed by the NBA, a level of stability, which still exists to this day. It was home. Uh, Wes and I didn't know each other. We were in the NIT together, but we didn't play Louisville. So my point is, um, I was excited to have that opportunity to bring women's professional basketball, help bring women's professional basketball to my home area. And, uh, and we struggled, you know, it was what it was. Um, but, uh, would I do it again for more money? You bet I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always so, the case. So, so, so coach, what did, what, did you, what did you start doing after you, um, you left the, the mystics? What did you start playing you golf with your so father? You're, you're, you retired? Just enjoyed life? No, no, I didn't retire. Are you kidding? No, I had, I had tuition at Harvard to pay. No, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I said, really, I started playing golf. My sister nailed me and my brother-in-law Leo told me that I should pick up that game that I thought was too slow. Um, little did I know. So uh, two years later, I got the head job at Fordham University in New York City in the Atlantic 10. And, uh, you know, you're up there. We, we lived in uh, Stanford, Connecticut, you know, not too far from where you probably live, my friend. And I don't want to give out your, uh, you know, mailing address. Or anything <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, what, Keith, where do you live? So I can tell the world. Come on, Keith. Come on. Uh, I live in Falls no, Church. No, no, no. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, I went to Fordham. Uh, loved that experience up there. <clears throat> it was a prerequisite, if you will, for not really, but you know, I coached at two Jesuit universities, Fordham and Georgetown, and you know, uh, as the interim coach at Georgetown. Uh, and then after six years. Um, I went back to the WNBA as an assistant with the Minnesota Lynx and then the Indiana Fever and we came within a Diana Taurasi jump shot of winning the world championships and she broke our hearts uh, with the Phoenix Mercury and then ended up with the Los Angeles Lakers with a pretty good player named Candace Parker. So, uh, um, and in between, I've kind of, you know, I coached uh, Alfred Street's men's uh, church team. Um, <laughs> we have a nice trophy. Uh, and, and then last year, the 2019, 20 season, my wife and I moved from Leesburg back to Alexandria where I'm from, obviously. And I coached with my good friend, Diane Lewis, the head coach at Edison high school. We won the state championship co state champions with Madison, but nonetheless, yeah. you know, we had five, uh, college prospects on that team. And so, uh, so yeah, now I'm officially retired. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting when you say five division one or, or college prospects on the Edison team, uh, Northern Virginia has always been a hotbed for girls talent. I mean, always yes. even back into the um, mid seventies, we had Ginger Rouse, we had Debbie Young, we had 
I mean, Kathy Grimes, you just go on and on. Boys, we've always struggled. And I think part of that is our, our top uh, boys players would go downtown and play in the DC teams, private schools, um, or, or what have you. Maybe we had a reputation of not being as tough as some of the uh, the schools down in Norfolk or, or Richmond and stuff. But it, with, with girls, we always were probably one of the toughest areas of basketball in, in the country, which yes. probably helped you at George Mason. Absolutely, yeah. Again, um, those names you mentioned are <clears throat> legendary names of uh, Northern Virginia High School girls basketball, as is my niece, Chrissy Winter Scott, um, my sister Janice, and her husband, Ronald Winters, the Reverend Ronald Winters, God rest his soul. Uh, uh, her dad, Chrissy's dad, played with the big O, Oscar Robinson, at Christmas Addicts High School in Indianapolis. So she she got it from both sides because even though my sister Janice was PhD, she was a brainiac, at least she was my uh, my sister Naomi and my sister. Then she got some some genes passed through her daughter because Christy was great. Yeah. Christy, in my opinion, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm biased, but I mean, just she's in the in the record books, the Hall of Fame, University of Maryland, undefeated state champs at South Lakes, blah, blah, on and on and on. And obviously one of the best broadcasters in, in the world. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, your point about boys high school basketball compared to women. Um, we lost in the state championship my junior year at Parker Gray uh, down at Hampton Institute at the time of hell. And uh, we... We found out later on because the VIA had some some youth in its existence and all the bylaws and rules and regulations regarding eligibility uh, and some other things. Um, and I, I have to tell you this quick story. So we lose the game, right? And they had a guy named Charlie Stukes. He ended up getting two Super Bowl rings um, in the NFL. <clears throat> some IC Norcom High School in 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 in, uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia, and, and we again we had a good team, but they beat us, all right? You know, and, and I, I guess I was the best person on the team my junior year, um, but I'm 15 years old. I'm a 15 year old junior, and our principal heard that they had a guy who was a grown man. I mean, not, not in his teens, but <laughs> so so fast forward, you know, Charlie Stukes and I are sitting next to each other at the VIA, the Black High School League uh, Hall of Fame induction ceremonies. And I didn't know who he was. We just played him and shook his hands. You know, we come back to Alexander. So I knew he was one of the inductees, as was I. And, and when they called his name, he went up with four other people, took the, took the photo. And uh, they had a co-op program in the Tywater area because of the uh, the naval yard being the presence that it is. And so some of the guys would work a half a day and go to school a half a day, work a half a day, you know, when well, that adds up, you know, chronologically. So our principle was correct because when I congratulated Charlie on winning the state championship over Parker, he said, yeah, you guys were city boys. Y'all thought it was going to beat us, huh? And I said, well, yeah. I said, Charlie, you look really good, man. You know, how old are you? He said, I'm 75. I was 69 at the time. <laughs> 69. Oh so it was true, you know. It was true anyway. But that's no. We still should have won the game. I don't care. Uh, but you know, I never, I never got over that. I guess. <laughs> but uh, you come... girls high school basketball. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. one of the uh, you talked about Carrie Kachunas's performance when she scored 40, 42 points at 50, or 50 51. Points, 51 points. One of the best performances I've ever seen in one of your players is Michael Jackson against T.C. Williams in the regional final. I think he scored 39 points. And I think he must have had 25 of them or so in the second half at, at Robinson. Wrong. Was, uh, wrong. Fourth quarter. Fourth yeah. quarter. Fourth quarter. Yeah, 28 in the last six minutes of the fourth quarter. Right. It was that's the fourth right. quarter. Yeah. And that's yeah. without so, three-pointers. Without a three-pointer. Yeah. And so the rest of the story is, again, our principal at South Lakes, George Felton, right, you know, who was a basketball coach at Luther Jackson. And he said it jokingly, you know, we're both Catholics, whatever. So he said, uh, said, Jimmy, you know, here we, it was, it wasn't right after the game. Otherwise I would have punched him, I guess. But the next day he said, yeah, Jimmy, Jim, why don't you turn Michael loose? I said, I wasn't holding him back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was, it was, it was amazing though. I, I'm glad you referenced that because we had beaten TC during the regular season and they were good and all that. And we were too, but uh, Michael was remarkable. You know, I always, 
I keep uh, Kevin Sutton and Tommy Amber. Mm-hmm. I keep them humble because, you know, it, it depends on who you talk to. You know, if you talk to Stu Vetter, then he'll say, well, Kevin Sutton was the best guard. Or if you talk to Red Jenkins, you know, you know, Red thinks he invented guard from Woodson High School, you know, and, only, and he said, oh, Tommy was whatever. Well, Michael was the best. I mean, just Michael was the best. Who made it to the pros? That's a, a case closed. So anyway. I would say, I would say Michael and Hubert Davis. That would, that would be, those would be well, my- I was just talking about in that era. era, uh, era. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if you want to go back, if you want to start that stuff, Julian, you know, <laughs> I've been to the barbershop yesterday or Saturday. So, you know, we talk it all the time. So if you want to talk the best, I mean, then uh, some guy named Grant Hill, you know, who, uh, yeah. who, who I left to Wendell. Thank you, Wendell. Yeah, thank you, Wendell. You're, you're welcome, Wendell Bird. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah must, well, I can must, tell you, Coach, that uh, Michael, Kevin, and Tommy were my era. Michael's yeah. same age, Kevin, same age, and Tommy's one year younger. So I grew up playing with all three of those guys, with and against them. And, and um, Michael and, certainly was the strongest through the childhood years. Yes. I knew you were keep, smart, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing about the thing about Michael is, is that he was a he was a tweener. He was a he was a scorer, but he was really a, a college point guard, a great college point guard. But in, in high school, he was just a scorer. So I think Tommy had a and Kevin, they had positions. They were obviously point guards. I think Michael made, shoot. what's that? That's because those two couldn't shoot. Well, they, 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 yeah, they, they couldn't shoot like Michael. No, I mean, Michael was just an incredible scorer. No, and I, I think know, yeah. that ability to score kind of, uh, you know, maybe, Michael, maybe people take, take that for granted. I always thought that Michael just did what was needed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's really it. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, I mean, they're all, you know, we're having fun here. But they're all three of them. My goodness. Yeah. But, but you know, again, in my opinion, uh, and, and we can put him in the top whatever of all DMV. Including you know Elgin and Kevin Durant and and uh, Adrian Danley and Dave Bing. I mean you know, Grant Hill's got to be right up there. Yes, has and, to be and, in my opinion. And so. one player that I'm surprised about is your is your West Virginia fellow alum Tyrone Shaw. Tyrone was a guy I played against. He played at TCU Williams. He played right. JV as a sophomore. He was he was a guy that he was he was always a good player, but his game was not pretty. He was very you know very unconventional. He's very creative. And I don't think people realize how good he was until he got to West Virginia. You know, we, we've done a couple of polls in, on the Facebook group. And I mean, the respect that he has in Northern Virginia is, is immense. So, you know, when you, when you talk about your top 10 players of all time in Northern Virginia, I think Tyrone Shaw has got to be one of them. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he gets plenty of props from the other West Virginia so. guys. <clears throat> yeah, he does. Yeah. What was that, Coach? No, I was just kidding. I said, that's your opinion, Julian, and I know you're sticking with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I well, want to I... throw out a name because you, you asked me, you know, mm-hmm. so you got you got me started here, brother. Well, so you, you asked me to talk about some of those great Parker great teams and players, right? Mm-hmm. All right? Now, I didn't just brush through them. I tried to give them the respect on their name, like LeBron said, that they deserve. However, there's one brother who is the only – Parker Gray player graduate because I didn't graduate from Parker Gray four years there and I'm claiming Parker Gray I don't care Groveton uh, but <laughs> I made all met in part because of what I did at Parker Gray okay but my point is Walter Griffin who graduated in 1957 won those three on those three straight state championship teams went to the University of Connecticut uh, Preston okay check his stats up there it, he didn't graduate but he played two fabulous seasons high shooting percentages, double-double averages and all that. Uh, and he is the only Parker Gray basketball player to ever make first team all met. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, if you see the byline of, of one of the uh, outstanding uh, professional photographers for the Washington football team, uh, Elijah Griffin is his son. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did he, play pro, did he play pro ball, Walter Griffin? He did not. No, he did not. Yeah. did not. No. Well, I'll definitely look for him then and make sure to post – I'll find some pictures of him and certainly post on the site. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, coach, this this is this has been great. I mean, I, I, you gave us a lot of your time. I know. Uh, you know you're, I'm retired, man. I'm retired. I got a lot. Of time. <laughs> you got a lot of time. Yeah. Y'all got to go to work sometime, I guess. So. Yeah. And there's well, snow on the golf course. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this well, this is this has been great. I don't know if you have any more stories to tell us, or if Preston and Keith have any more questions for you, yeah. but. Uh, I really, we really appreciate you doing this. I, I, uh, 
I've been doing interviews for a long time, but I usually write them. But I realized when I was reading all about you that writing this up would have been, you know, would have, would have taken me 20 pages because you've, you've done so much in your basketball career and your, in your career generally as well. So, you know, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. This is just a relation to you. It's like, I don't know. I mean, well, um, hold on, Preston. Let me take my glasses off for you. Hold on. <laughs> I'll put my glasses on. Okay. Yeah. So get up. All right. All right. Well, bring it, you, bring it, Preston. Uh, well, since you talked about sports, my father, Preston, my father, Preston, he was, um, played during that time. He was a big time baseball player. I just didn't know if you'd heard of him. Probably. What high school? <sighs> might have been, it might have been, um, well, he was out in, um, he was out in Arlington. How right? from Boston? Hmm? Was he, uh, how old is he? He was your year. He's born in 46. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Hoffman Boston was Hoffman the Boston. black high school in Arlington. Yeah. Right. And, um, uh, but you know, baseball was, uh, that was an afterthought, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. He yeah. played basketball <laughs> too, but baseball was his sport. Though. Okay. Yeah. Did he grow up in Green Valley? Yeah. He grew up in Green Valley. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey man, again, 16 or seven Quaker Lane up by where uh, Lindsay Cadillac, you know, I'd ride my bike mm-hmm. down there to the weenie beanie, you know, oh. get the half smokes and then play on four mile run. I mean, that was, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the story you told about, the story you told about Dixie Pig, I, I don't think, I used to, I don't think I ever went inside. I think now I know why. It was like okay. All the people I grew up with at that time, we were past Dixie Pig and we never went in. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how much I was born in 1966, and it's amazing how much the area changed between the time you went to Groveton in 63, 64, to the time I was in high school. When uh, Keith and, and Preston and the whole group was started posting pictures, one thing that struck us was most of the teams in the western part of the county, or even the central part of the county, they were all white until the late 70s and until the 80s, until until uh, South Lakes, and then you know Woodson, Robinson, we'd have one or two blacks per team. But it's it's amazing how long it took for all the you know the western part of the county for those schools to get really fully integrated, uh, right. at least in, in, to some extent diverse. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, the, the um, not migration, you know, because that wasn't truly migration, but you know, the outward mobility and whatever. Uh, again, before Jenny Dean, you mentioned them, you know. Um, that was Manassas Industrial High School, yeah. which uh, uh, had students from as far away as where my mother grew up. Uh, and they had accommodations for their students to, to board overnight. It was again, a re- truly regional high school. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, yeah, if, you wanna, if you want to um, get some additional interesting perspectives um, maybe you'll hear a little bit about it and take what you, what you like, uh, this Friday when Vincent and I do okay. the, uh, the Zoom class with T.C. Williams High School, but he and his father especially are just not only military historians, and I, I encourage everyone to go to the History Makers, where, uh, uh, the brother from 60 Minutes, uh, interviewed Vincent, and you, you t- you're talking about getting, you know, a PhD in, in black military history. Um, Vincent is remarkable in, in terms of his, 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 um, his rigor and, and preparation and exercise and learning and, and disseminating that uh, discipline. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, know you, you, you talk about again, the, uh, the patterns of, uh, of schools being integrated almost in waves, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Parker Gray, I think, was a was a forerunner. Certainly not in terms of integration, but in terms of locality uh, mm-hmm. and being able to. And I'm saying this very humbly, but being able to expose, particularly the bas- the sport of basketball, to those far western high schools. You know, we we would go to Jenny Dean. And they didn't have a locker room. We'd change in the, in the cafeteria and come outside with our little caps on and go into the gym, you know, because the, the, the sophistication, if you will. You know, again, we were country boys from Alexandria. So Dave Bing and all those guys from D.C. thought the same thing about us. But they, they were good baseball players, good football players. But the basketball 
uh, sophistication, nuances had not arrived uh, out there for for those black schools. So, uh, yeah. so I, I had never heard of Jenny Dean until we started this group, and I I had posted some photos of Jenny Dean. I did a little research, and and then I found out that before Luther Jackson was built in '54, there was no high school for blacks for black students in Fairfax County. Yeah, so right. if you if you were a, a black high school student and you wanted to continue, you had to go to school in D.C. Uh, yes. on your own dime to get to get the school. Right. Um, some some students went to Hoffman, Boston, I, I guess maybe Parker Gray as well. Yes. And most of the, the black high school students went to Jenny Dean in Manassas. And it's just, it's amazing to realize just, you know, 70 years ago or so, there was no high school in Fairfax County at all. I mean, you had to go to Jenny Dean, which is why they had dorms, like you said. That was information right. I didn't even know until a few months ago. You know, that just recently, uh, they put up a statue of Jenny Dean. Uh, mm -hmm who the school was named after out there. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where it is, it's in Manassas, but uh, probably on the site. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an elementary school now called Jenny, Jenny Dean, but uh, you know, black woman. Uh, uh, and last thing, perhaps, you know how uh, black, I'm from the black church, so black preachers always say, and my last point is, and then 20 <laughs> minutes later, they're still talking. <laughs> but, but this November, oh, November, wow. This April the 3rd, we will unveil the Earl Lloyd statue at Charles Houston Recreation Center on the same, the very same hollowed sites uh, grounds that where Parker Gray, where he attended, uh, was, was located. And it is the second statue, the first of which was this exact replica of the first uh, that in 2014 uh, was unveiled at West Virginia State University, now his alma mater. And Oscar Robinson and Bill Russell were there. Well, we have, and this is public knowledge, and I'm one of the co MCs, but we have, uh, because it's all virtual, we have videos in from Dave Bing, because Dave played for Earl and Earl worked for him, you know, Detroit Pistons and all. Ray Scott, who followed Earl as his former assistant with the Detroit Pistons. Um, James Brown, Tony Dungy. Uh, who I tried to recruit at Duke. He was a real good basketball player from Jackson, Michigan. Um, um, Ted Leonsis from the Washington Wizards. Um, uh, governor Northam, former Governor uh, Wilder, um, the current coach at West Virginia State. It's going to be a fabulous uh, tribute to, to a, a man who is truly an international icon and, and is getting more and more recognition. He passed away uh, five years ago now. More and more recognition from the NBA, you know, along with Chuck Cooper and Metal, uh, Sweetwater Clifton is the first three to integrate uh, the NBA. But, but he's, our, he's our hometown hero. Um, and so where they're taking statues down in Richmond, you know, I think uh, Arthur Ashe and one other statue may still be the only two remaining there. We're putting them up. We're putting at least Earl's up. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, tribute to him. His wife, his widow will be there and, and his sons and all. So, uh, so we're really excited about that. April the 3rd, which is his birthday, Earl's birthday. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to be there. I'm okay. sorry, Keith. I just said that's fantastic. Oh yeah. yeah. It's on my calendar. Yeah. yeah. Mine and, we'll, as well. and we'll do what we can do to, uh, you know, help promote the event as well on, on Facebook you. and and other, other other methods as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, coach, this has been great. We appreciate so much your time. I, I know your time is is free right now, but uh, let's we, let's do this again. Yeah, please. Yeah, yes. Make the check out to my wife. She spelled Karen with a K, <laughs> so just make it out to her. Is it 12,000? 12, 12, you said twelve thousand. <laughs> Inflation now. Inflation. Uh, <laughs> hey y'all. Hey, I enjoyed it, man. Yeah, really. Uh, thank you again for all you're doing. I really, really. Uh, know that other people like myself uh, really appreciate your efforts it's a uh, it's it's our history to tell you know if we don't you know, it won't be told correctly all the time so uh, i'm glad we we are empowering that aspect of uh, of history yeah we're very lucky to have such a rich history. part of it yeah it is yeah you definitely were and it's so great though that this site has become i mean it's basketball but it's also history and it's neighborhood history it's a chance for us to to enshrine these memories. And it's such a great, it's just such a great site to have. And it's so great that you could do this. 
Yeah. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Okay. All right, y'all take care now. Thanks to you guys. Go right, Wahoo guys. Wah. That's right. Wahoo Wah. There you wah go. Hey, 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 man, y'all got to get together. <laughs> I love Tony Bennett, but man, no, nah, they're good. I mean, but the losing to Duke, come on, man. That was painful. <laughs> yeah, we won't man. hold your Duke. We won't hold your being a Duke against you either. Yeah. No, no. I'm a West Virginia. I just worked at Duke. Okay. <laughs> All right. See y'all. Okay. Okay, guys. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.